Hey everyone, uh, my name is Liz Gilliams. I'm a resident at Emory and I'm on my HIV rotation this month and I'll be talking about hypogonadism in men living with HIV. Just to give you a short outline about the presentation, I'll first talk about hypogonadism, the prevalence, pathophysiology, um, relation to HIV, clinical manifestations, diagnosis and testing, as well as treatment options and management. Um, and then I'll speak briefly about erectile dysfunction and the diagnosis and its interaction with antiretroviral therapy. So let's start off with a definition of hypogonadism. It's defined as decreased testosterone production or decreased sperm production. And I just wanted to review the hypothalamic pituitary testes axis. And as everyone remembers, the hypothalamus releases gonadotropin releasing hormone, which then acts on the pituitary, um, which then generates luteinizing hormone or um, follicle stimulating hormone, which then is active on the testes and specifically on the Leydig cells, which develop uh, testosterone. We'll be mostly talking about adults with hypogonadism. There are many um, congenital defects related to hypogonadism, but specifically we'll be talking about either primary hypogonadism, which is a deficiency in um, testosterone production at the testes, or secondary hypogonadism, which is upstream, um, which is a pituitary definition. So the prevalence of hypogonadism in men with HIV um, as a baseline for everyone, um, the prevalence in the general population of HIV uninfected men has been cited at 6%. And in the pre-antiretroviral therapy, there have been reports of uh, prevalence of about 30 to 40% of hypogonadism in men um, living with HIV. But um, that percentage did decrease with um, antiretroviral therapy to about 13 to 40%. But it was commonly seen in you know, younger men, um, even as young as the 20s. Um, and the kind of cases you often see in men living with HIV are mostly secondary hypogonadism as, a, as opposed to primary hypogonadism. And that's um, generally 86% of cases are, um, you'll see are going to be the psych secondary hypogonadism. So let's talk about the pathogenesis of hypogonadism um, and its relation to HIV. Um, on the left, you'll see that um, there's a diagram describing uh, hypogonadotropic hypogonadism or secondary hypogonadism. And starting off at the top of the left in the diagram, you'll see that there are lots of different factors, frailty, aging with HIV, lipid dystrophy. Um, these all are thought to have um, actions on the hypothalamus and then um, decrease of GnRH. Um, Moving down lower in the diagram, you'll see that um, other factors such as visceral fat um, and lipodystrophy also are in, put into play. Um, and the mechanism thought related to that is that increased visceral fat um, can lead to increased androgen aromatization to estrogen, which then inhibits F FSH release and then decreased testosterone release. You'll also see that um, other things such as opportunistic infections, um, medications such as opiates um, can also depress pituitary function. Um, then moving over to the right side of the diagram, you'll see um, pathways related to hypergonadotropic hypogonadism, um, such as a situation where there would be uh, decreased testosterone release, um, but also elevated FSH and LH release. Um, the mechanisms thought related to that is there may be some inflammation at the level of the um, Leydig cells leading to decreased testosterone release. So some clinical manifestations that you're going to want to think about when talking to your patients um, and testosterone deficiency. The symptoms you might hear about are things such as decreased libido, decreased sexual activity, um, problems with erectile function, and um, problems with sleep-related erections. But there may also be problems such as fatigue, depressed mood, hot flashes, and fertility. Um, as well as on your exam, you may find um, decreased muscle mass and hair. Um, you might have um, patients with osteoporosis that would come up, or rarely um, if they're um, deficiency is severe and long-standing, you might see decreased testicular size and gynecomastia. 
Um, but a lot of these things, especially the symptoms, um, overlap a lot with the symptoms of chronic illness and possibly even comorbidities such as chronic hepatitis. So it can be kind of hard to tease it out, um, but it is something you should key into when patients talk about these symptoms. And who should you test for hypogonadism? Um, looking at the IDSA primary care guidelines for management of persons with HIV, um, they recommend um, testing patients who um, have reported decreased libido, decreased erectile dysfunction, have reduced bone mass or low trauma fractures, or who report hot flashes. Um, and you may also consider testing um, patients who are just reporting vague symptoms, such as fatigue or who have depression. So let's talk about diagnostic testing and the relationship between free and binded testosterone. Um, I just like to break it down really simple. Um, you'll see on the left, um, there's the total testosterone measurement in green, which is mostly the measurements that most societies recommend measuring first when looking for hypogonadism and testosterone deficiency. But on the right side, you can see that there are more subtle aspects that put in that contribute to the measurement of total testosterone being the sex hormone binding globulin, as well as free testosterone measurements. So just to talk a little bit about how total testosterone um, should be measured, um, it should be a morning measurement sometime between 8 and 10 in the morning. Um, that's when there's the peak testosterone um, levels. Um, and what you'll want to see for um, a diagnosis of testosterone deficiency is a total serum testosterone less than about 300 nanograms per deciliter. Um, and you will want to see that even though you might get one measurement, you want to verify that on at least two measurements um, to make the diagnosis, at least biochemically. Um, then moving more towards the right side of the picture, there is a relationship between the level of sex hormone binding globulin and the amount of free testosterone free that might be active um, in the uh, patient's endocrine system. So things you might want to keep in mind, though, is that sex hormone binding globulin can be altered um, in HIV um, infection, as well as with um, patients who are co-infected with hepatitis C, hepatitis B. Um, aging can affect levels of sex hormone binding globulin, as well as obesity. Um, so some things you may want to know is that HIV can increase sex hormone binding globulin. So what a situation like that would look like is if a normal, you have a patient with normal total testosterone, that can sort of hide a low free testosterone level. So if you're seeing a patient still with symptoms, you might want to go ahead and measure a free testosterone level and sex hormone binding globulin. Um, you may also want to consider that in patients who have altered protein um, production, such as in patients with hepatitis C or hepatitis B. Um, so again, um, then also looking at measurement of free testosterone, again, that should be measured in the morning, um, and you would consider it if sex hormone binding globulin may be altered, but this is a test that's not very widely available, so kind of limited by the availability in your setting. So putting it all together, um, I have a pretty good slide here about the diagnostic algorithm that's suggested um, for testosterone measurement in men um, who are infected with HIV versus if they are co-infected with hep C or hep B. Um, so you'll want to start out with definitely measuring a total testosterone and an LH level, um, but specifically um, in co-infected patients, you'll want to think about ordering a sex hormone binding globulin. Um, and then depending on the level of the total testosterone level, uh, you're going to decide whether you're going to go forward with further measurement to confirm a diagnosis. If the testosterone level is still elevated, then uh, you might want to measure um, a free testosterone level just to confirm, um, and if the free testosterone level is still low. And there's a coordination with uh, the compensatory LH um, uh, measure level, such as if your LH is increased, that means that you'll have secondary or sorry, primary hypogonadism, whereas if your LH um, is normal or decreased, that would be a, sec a case of secondary hypogonadism. So just a, a good thing to keep in mind of the order of different levels that you'll start with, but definitely start with measurement of LH and total testosterone. 
Some other things that you want to keep in mind when um, beginning a patient on testosterone therapy is some additional evaluation, such as measurement of the hemoglobin hematocrit. There is a um, small risk of polycythemia that could put the patient at risk for venous thromboembolism with beginning testosterone therapy as well as if the patient is over 40 years old and if they are known to have um, you know, mildly elevated um, PSA level greater than 0.6, you'll want to perform a digital rectal exam of the prostate as well as measure a PSA level for before beginning therapy. Um, and then depending on those results, you may want to consider referring the patient to urology if they are abnormal. So there are about three different types of uh, testosterone therapy available. Broadly, uh, intramuscular injection, transdermal, whether patches or gels, and oral preparations. What you'll mostly see is either intramuscular injection or transdermal patches. Um, and looking at the top part of the figure, testosterone cipionate and testos testosterone ethanate, um, you'll see that these are usually preparations that are given um, as injections every two to four weeks. Um, and these injections are generally pretty cheap. Um, they are available at Ponce Clinic. Um, but you'll see on the last level there's testosterone and decanoate. Um, and this injection is an extra long injection, can be given every 10 to 14 weeks, um, though it can only be administered by registered providers due to a risk of anaphylaxis. So that's why you might not see this in all settings. Um, next, going down, transdermal preparations. There are patches that are available that are applied every 12 hours, as well as gel that um, is applied generally daily. Um, these are a little bit more expensive, but might be a better option for patients who are needle averse. Um, and finally, at the bottom, there are oral preparations of testosterone, um, but, and they are given either BID or daily. But um, these are absorbed pretty well from uh, the gut, but they do suffer from a first pass effect, so they don't maintain pretty high levels. Um, so these are not recommended uh, by endocrine societies for supplementation. When you have a patient on testosterone therapy, uh, there are a couple things that you want to keep in mind when monitoring them. Uh, and you'll want to monitor their testosterone levels um, to assess for response of the supplementation every three to six months um, following the initiation therapy. Um, you're going to want to check that mid-cycle between administrations. So if you have a patient that you are giving uh, testosterone injections every four weeks, then you want to measure that testosterone level at about two weeks um, between administrations to get um, an accurate mid-cycle measurement of the total testosterone. And your goal levels are between 300 and 800 nanograms per deciliter. And again, something else to monitor is if the patient is over 40 years old and their PSA is over 0.6, um, you'll want to repeat a DRE and PSA level at three months, six months, and then usually about yearly if the patient is doing well on therapy. There are a couple contraindications to testosterone therapy being prostate or breast cancer, as these are hormone-dependent cancers, a high-risk PSA or abnormal DRE, high hematocrit or erythrocytosis, untreated sleep, obstructive sleep apnea, and heart failure. However, uh, more recently, cardiovascular disease has been a controversy relating to testosterone therapy. And most recently, um, there was a really large meta-analysis of 51 randomized control trials, including about 1,000 patients that did show no increased risk of cardiovascular events um, with patients who are on testosterone therapy. Um, so that is pretty reassuring that this treatment appears safe for most patients. However, there were a couple um, trials in the past that you might want to know about, um, specifically the testosterone in older men with sarcopenia trial. This is a randomized control trial in older men. Their average age was about 74 years old, 
And this trial um, showed an increased risk of self-reported myocardial infarctions in patients who were in the testosterone arm of the study compared to the placebo arm. But again, I think that study included men who may be a little bit more frail than the general population you'd consider uh, supplementing for. And um, another study that people point to as increased risk was a retrospective cohort study in men who went for left heart catheterization. And then um, in the cohort of patients who went on to subsequent testosterone supplementation were observed to have an increased rate of mort um, mortality and myocardial infarction. But just to put that into context, the increased risk was about 11.3%. 0.3% in the testosterone supplementation arm versus 10% in the placebo arm um, or in the non-supplemented arm. So I think that that risk, risk difference was pretty minimal and in the context of a pretty solid um, meta-analysis, I think that you can probably go forward in most patients who have compensated cardiovascular disease with testosterone supplementation. Now I'd like to talk about erectile dysfunction in men with HIV. Um, this is a common condition in patients who have hypogonadism or even eugonadal, um, but it's an important topic to discuss, especially because many patients you know, may even consider taking medication without your knowledge. So it's something you want to address because there are important implications for its interaction with antiretroviral therapy. Just to review um, the causes of erectile dysfunction, you'll want to think about include vascular insufficiency, neurologic disease, medication induced, especially with SSRIs, as well as psychogenic causes. In your assessment of erectile dysfunction, you'll want to take a good history, especially the pace of onset, especially if the pace of the onset is rapid. Um, if it just occurred out of nowhere, that might suggest a more psychogenic um, cause as opposed to an indolent history of um, worsening function that might um, suggest neurologic or vascular problems. Um, you'll also ask about the absence of spontaneous erections, and this would suggest a more neurologic or vascular etiology, as well as concurrent psychosocial stressors and prior urologic surgeries. And on your exam, you'll want to do a testicular exam to examine for atrophy, masses, or asymmetry, as well as assess femoral and peripheral pulses and assess for the cremasteric reflex. As you'll see, there's no routine laboratory workup that's generally recommended, really only workup that would be um, suggested by. Pharmacologic treatment for erectile dysfunction can be considered for either isolated erectile dysfunction or for patients with hypogonadism when appropriate testosterone supplementation has not been successful. And the mainstay of therapy is phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors, which I've listed on the slide. But important things you want to know is that there's a notable interaction with produce inhibitors, especially ritonavir, as well as uh, with cobisostat. These medications can increase your concentration of phosphodiesterase 5 inhibitors and have a significant risk for hypotension. When your patients are on um, those medications, cobisostat and ritonavir, you can adjust the doses of sildenafil. Um, and I think sildenafil might be a better option because um, it's the most short-acting um, and may have less risk for prolonged um, hypotension. And you can adjust that by dosing at 25 milligrams every 48 hours. Or for tadalafil, you can dose at 10 milligrams every 72 hours. But the most important thing really um, with this medication, as with any patient, um, HIV or not, is anticipatory guidance, especially with interactions um, with nitrates, um, with prolonged erections, and especially for hypotension when patients are taking um, the above medications we talked about. This slide lists my references and is the end of my talk. Thank you for listening, and I appreciate your attention.